for the Iranian nuclear accord. Editorially, over on the editorial page, the Times, the Times has come out strongly for the deal. Today's report consists mostly of the latest neoconservative talking points, and it's on A1 packaged as news analysis, right? So, oh, how awful Iran can produce uranium on an industrial scale 15 years in the future. Uh, various Democrats who say it's good, it's bad, but generally uh, bad. In 15 years, Iran will have a highly modern and internationally legitimized enrichment capability. That is a bitter t pill to swallow, says uh, Congressman Adam Schiff of California. You get the idea. Dennis Ross. Oh, my God. Winnip. Zolik, Kimmet, and Ross right again from the Bush uh, 41 State Department. Uh, Dennis Ross, uh, during the late Clinton administration, earned a reputation as Israel's lawyer. He participates with Sanger and Gordon, regurgitating claims that vulnerabilities must be addressed. The gap between the threshold and the weapon status after 15 is small. That's 15 years in the future. Won't you think of something to... Uh, to, to rectify some of these things if you're so concerned. Anyway, fortunately for the rest of us, the train has left the station. The British embassy is open. It's alive and well and open for business in Tehran. The Germans with Zygmar Gabriel, vice chancellor of Germany, have been there. They're getting huge contracts. The Japanese are there. Uh, the Italians, everybody in Europe is running to cash in. Only the U.S., is out of it because we have these wonderful neocons, right? That's our wonderful benefit of our country is that we've got this powerful neocon faction uh, and it's a disaster. So the idea that you could now tell Russia and China and Europe and the rest of the world that they've got to reimpose these sanctions because a gaggle of reactionary racist warmonger Republicans and some Democrats, I fear, in the Congress don't like it. This is a non-starter. This entire thing is over with. The UN Security Council has voted. The Iran Accord is a part of international law. This, argu this entire argument is over. And therefore, it would be good if the US Congress uh, did not embarrass itself by trying to harass this thing. If you do that, you're going against international law, or you become an international bandit. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, The uh, our last program of August, uh, and we're now in the last segment. So let's just look at some other themes. Now, we had this whiff of panic in the international finance markets this past week, uh, we also saw some pretty heavy-duty activity by the famous PPT, the Plunge Protection Team, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, using presumably either Treasury money or, more likely, Federal Reserve money. But in any case, U.S. public money used to prop up these stock prices, right? The Japanese have the openly acknowledged stock buying authority. The U.S. has something similar, but it's uh, more surreptitious now. China, as I pointed out in my polemics with the unfortunate Pepe Escobar in the last couple of weeks, uh, the Chinese leadership can be just as stupid and just as short-sighted as anybody else. And uh, indeed, some of these bureaucrats like to uh, you know, change course rather promptly, and unfortunately, this gets them into uh, big trouble. The principal problem, once again, is that this government is illegitimate. Nobody chose them. Nobody voted for them in any recognizable sense. So they're obsessed with their own vulnerability. And that, that is the definition of vulnerability. So they got to compensate for it. Now, we want to congratulate them on their uh, tremendous achievements in economic development. But they now seem to think that they've got to um, guarantee also a stock market bubble. We have this quote, which is being thrown around, that President Xi, who's going to be here next week, told a Chinese uh, constituent of his that the Shanghai market had already reached 4,000 on the index, and it was headed towards 10,000. And therefore, K 
cash in, invest, right? And indeed, what, what we seem to be seeing is margin that the Chinese system now allows small investors to borrow money to be able to uh, invest. Margin. Now, in the U.S., uh, there is a uh, – I think it's still there. We'll have to, we'll have to check. But uh, since the crash of 1929, the idea that you would buy uh, uh, stocks using borrowed money, this has been regulated. There's a percentage which is set. But, of course, under China, you have communism, but at the same time, total deregulation, right? There's no pension system. There's no, um, no kind of uh, social safety net in that sense. There's no minimum wage, all these things. They don't have any of that, although it's communism. Boy, oh, boy. So uh, this system is obviously very, very uh, vulnerable. Deng Xiaoping said to get rich is a glorious thing. And if, if she really said, I'm, I'm like to know whether this is true or not, that the market is going to go to 10,000 in Shanghai, that's just uh, irresponsible. Uh, and then to respond with these competitive devaluations. Now, it doesn't seem to have spread any further, but this stuff is not instantaneous, right? These, these are processes that work themselves out over months. I think it's Vietnam and Kazakhstan so far. Um, but those are, you know, that ain't hey. Those are important countries in their own right. Now, in terms of the U.S. side of it, we stand here for the lautenbach voitinsky approach which is that you've got to mobilize the credit-creating power of your central bank, make it act like a national bank, at least in part, and use that for infrastructure above all, infrastructure modernization. As much as you can spend is the right way to do it. We would also add, given the special problem of the U.S., the $1.2 or $1.3 trillion of high-interest student loans, those have got to be refinanced down to zero. That's the very least we can do for the new generation. So that gets us up to about six trillion, six and a half trillion of zero percent long term credits. A hundred year hundred year maturities on the infrastructure and decades and decades on the student loans. So we're talking about six trillion dollars of cheap, subsidized, zero percent long term federal credit for infrastructure and education. And that will give us the 30 million new productive jobs and the 10 million. We'll have to do the 10 million on the Treasury. Those are for people who need to be introduced into the workforce. Now, instead of this, right, we've had austerity. That's a failure. We've had Keynesian consumer led the stimulus, the, the supplemental. That didn't work. Good, good results in the short term, but it didn't create a permanent recovery because it didn't revive the capital goods markets. Instead, what we've seen is two things. One is called quantitative easing. Quantitative easing one, two, and three, we've told you what that was. Those are support operations for toxic derivatives to prevent the banks from having to sell those. The Fed buys them and hides the fact that they're intrinsically bankrupt. They have negative value. Remember, get the delete button, get the shredder, get rid of them. They have negative value. They're like the Rasputnik back in uh, Al Caps with Labner. The other side of it is you have QE on the one side, right, to prop up the rotten derivative structure. On the other side, 0% for zombie banks and for hedge fund hyenas, but not for anybody in the real economy. So QE ended last November, the, November 2014, and they all complain now. They say, oh, our stock market is going sideways. We have no growth. Yeah, right, because you have a rotten speculative economy. And now they say, we're afraid that the Fed will take away the 0%. Yes, uh, it's bad to take away the 0%. Now, it's bad to have 0% for derivatives only. We, we want to do it precisely the other way around. We want to say producers will be rewarded with 0% or close to it, as close to it as we can get, as low as we can get it. That's where we're going to keep it. But not speculators, right? Right now, it's all for speculators, and the productive side gets nothing. Let's try flipping that over. Let's turn that situation around. The producers get 0%, and the financial parasites get whatever their wonderful market uh, allows them, right? They, they love the, the free market, so let them take their chances out there. So I think that's, that's pretty much it. Now, this stuff could go on. Uh, China is big. 
Uh, their influence on raw materials and oil and so forth are big. But the main thing that's magnifying these shocks now is derivatives. There are as many derivatives now. Their total value is approximately what it was in 2008, If because we have to guess on this, right? Since still, despite uh, Dodd-Frank, it's not reportable. You can't find out. No authoritative um, uh, statistic about this. But it means the presence of derivatives, as we saw in 2008, magnifies and increases the resonance of any little shock turns into a total earthquake. The other thing I want to reassure people about, uh, Freemasons, right? These Freemasons lodges, which are so poisonous and toxic to the future of humanity, they love to spread irrationality and hysteria. Remember Y2K? The world was going to end on January 31st, 1999. Somehow it didn't happen last year. Two years ago, we had the Mayan calendar of 2012, the end of the world. No, nope. uh, this time, without even a calendar. I mean, but the Y2K had some kind of a calendar behind it, and the Mayan, Mayan calendar had the Mayan calendar. But now we have lists of 21 random events that seem to happen pretty much every year, whether in October or September or August. But we're told that something apocalyptic is going to happen in September, October of 2015. And I say to people, put aside this pornography of fear, put aside the duperies and the dupe markets of the Freemasons and we also noticed that the libertarians, right? The libertarians love this stuff, right? They roll in it. They cavort in it. It is just up their alley. If you get a Freemasonic libertarian, hey, somebody like Ron Paul or Rand Paul, these are precisely the people that uh, keep everything going with promises of the apocalypse and other forms of uh, crude, transparent, brutal fear pornography. Uh, it's time to be national, national, 